This is the end of a week in which we've been discussing the social ethical challenges of emerging technologies. And we're very lucky to have Ives Ibsurda from Montana State University here today. Uh, Ives did graduate work in Washington, uh, UW, and in Maryland, uh, in College Park. He's in the physics department now at Montana State University. Uh, where he works on, now I'm reading this straight off the website, reduced dimensionality systems and their nanostructured behavior. <laughs> and um, the, maybe the main reason to bring Ike here uh, was to bring someone who could sort of really communicate what is different uh, about uh, the behavior of nanostructured materials because We've all got a sense this week that there's something big coming down the pipeline here, um, something in which a lot of money has already been invested by government, and something that will have a lot of commercial uh, promise and applications down the road. But when it comes to understanding what exactly it is to be a nanomaterial, it's actually a little tricky. It's not as easy as it sounds. I mean, it's something to do with scale. But it's more than that. It's also to do with properties. You know, what actually happens when you scale down like that? Uh, and I've had some experience communicating some of these issues uh, to broader audiences, including a workshop uh, put on by the National Nanotechnology Initiative just recently. Um, so I look forward to hearing a little bit more about nanomaterials from Ives. Thanks very much. We have to remember that this is an informal talk, and so you're supposed to ask questions, and you're supposed to interrupt when I say something you didn't understand. So that's where we'd like to start. Well, we've all heard about nanotechnology. We've heard that it's going to be a revolution in science and an innovator in industry, and if it is, it's going to be probably the best planned revolution that's been around for a while, because a lot of people are making a lot of predictions. And one of the things that we've learned from experience is that if I make predictions that in the future don't come true, the disappointment becomes rather broad and it actually covers across the things that were uh, uh, beneficial as well as the things that just didn't quite turn out. Some of those promises are made in order to get people excited about the topic. I think people are now excited about nanotechnology. We now have to try to separate out the fact and the myth and we really want to go forward and try to tell you what nanotechnology means to us as scientists, and that's what I'm representing. What, as a physicist, I find exciting about nanotechnology, and it really is this idea of being an emergent property. It's not something I couldn't predict. It's just something that I didn't predict by doing a simple extension of either from the small to something bigger, a nanoscaled structure, atoms to nano, or something really big, like a truck, down to a very small item. Why doesn't a miniature truck on the nanoscale work? And that's what I hope to get across, from you, across to you. First thing I'd like to do is to identify a couple of main players in the field that you can go to and read about on your own. If I were to tell you who to look up, there's two names that come to mind, Eric Drexler and Richard Smalley. Eric Drexler is a proponent of nanotechnology. He's telling you a lot of very exciting things that nanotechnology might be able to do in the future. Richard Smalley is the discoverer or inventor or maybe the first guy who saw carbon-60 or Buckminster Fullerene or buckyballs as they're called. It was uh, described as a new state of matter but from what we've seen and what you will see a lot of times is these nanomaterials have been around forever. Buckyballs were there probably at the inception of the planet. It's just we could never see them. We've only now worked out ways to identify what these things are and their properties. 
So one of the difficulties you have is these aren't artificial. They've been around for a long time, but now the kinds of applications we're putting them to are a little bit more artificial. So those are the two names that I would point out. Um, I now want to kind of describe for you why people find it exciting. And the main reason, of course, is money. So here's a nanotech report from Steve Forbes. Stunning breakthroughs in nanotechnology are about to transform the future of our economy and make early investors rich. And if I could only push on that button, I would become rich. And he has, I get his personal no risk, 100% satisfaction guarantee that I'll make money on this. And that's one of the drivers, believe me, that's one of the strong drivers in nanotechnology. But there are some other drivers that are almost as exciting. Let's see what we've actually done. And how would I quantify that? I can show you a couple of examples, or I can show you some awards. Here's the Wall Street Journal Awards for Technology Innovation. These are the silver awards overall for any innovation in technology that happened in these years. The gold awards all go to Microsoft, GM, the big companies, GM not genetic modified foods, but General Motors. Uh, they go to the big companies. The silver award winners, here's one. Pill-shaped video camera screens the esophagus in 2004. 2005, environmentally friendly nanomaterial coatings. 2006, heliovote, lightweight solar energy panels, all nanostructured. So the silver awards in technology innovations by the Wall Street Journal all went to nanotechnology. You guys have all heard of GM and Microsoft. You ever hear of these companies? So that's one of the issues that comes up. Innovations are really driven by small businesses because they can take the risk that the big businesses don't often do with doing these kinds of things. So here I have the first view graph showed you where the money comes from, venture capitalists working with small businesses on things that haven't been patented yet. So do you think they're going to talk about it until after they've got their products out into the market? Probably not. Do you think they need to work very quickly in order to return a profit to the venture capitalists? Probably. So now we've got, let me review, small companies which aren't set up to look at the environmental impacts, creating things on a very fast time frame, and doing things a little bit under the radar. So we have to be careful about what we are uh, putting out into the environment. The good news is these are small companies. You're not talking about large amounts of materials. The bad news is all of the environmental testing will be done out in the public. If I were to ask you, where did you think nanotechnology comes from, hopefully you came up with Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman was a physicist. In 1959, he presented an article. There's plenty of room at the bottom. And he asked the question, why can't we write the Encyclopedia Britannica on the head of the pin? And his answer was, well, we can. All we got to do is shrink the text by 25,000. And then he went further to ask other questions. What would we use to write it? How would we write it? How would we read it? That was the beginning of his article. There's a website where you can get his article. It's a really remarkable piece of work because he, uh, Richard Feynman has always been someone who communicates to the general public. And if you read this, you read everything that nanotechnology has, been, has become. In fact, if I were to pull out a couple of the words, the first thing he says at the very beginning is he's inspired by biology. That's what drives nanotechnology for Richard Feynman. Why? Because biology isn't simply about writing information, it's doing something. It's make small movable machines. I'm going to be making machines that replicate. I'm going to swallow a surgeon. I'm going to use DNA as memory. DNA is used as memory. In fact, it's the densest memory right now. The biggest problem with DNA is its readout time is awful slow. So if I want to read out my DNA, it's a long process. So I can't put it into my computer right now. I need to fast read out. He also identifies some problems in, fric in friction that haven't been solved yet. Even though this was in 1959, about 50 years ago, we haven't figured out how friction works in nanotechnology. And he understood what the limits to understanding it were all about, and we still haven't got anywhere on it. So it's a remarkable piece of work. If you can, look it up. So nanotechnology, the idea behind it, as he pointed out, is building things atom by atom. 
here we have a little nanotechnology machine pushing some atoms around. You know, you kind of wonder what the machines are made of if they're pushing atoms around. And that's uh, one of the difficulties is in popularization, this is what you see, it makes no sense, but it gets across to the public what we're trying to do. In actual fact, the smaller I try to make something, the bigger machine I need to do it with. Some of the biggest machines out there right now are to investigate nanotechnology materials. And big machines are usually quite expensive. That's why this is really seen as a First Nation product, because to do this requires a lot of work. Uh, these machines don't work for doing nanotechnology. What did Richard Feynman suggest we use? He said use dust mites. So here's a dust mite. Uh, there's a dust mite sitting on top of a, looks like a nanostructured material to me. Nope, these are micron sized materials. These are microelectromechanical systems or MEMS devices. Micron is a factor of a thousand too big. So I can't use a dust mite to make my nanotechnology. I gotta use something a lot smaller. Interestingly enough, in Richard Feynman's, uh, and a lot of people point at this work as the beginning of nanotechnology, he addresses everything, but he doesn't say one thing. He never mentions the word nano. So that's a recent addition to Richard's work. So let's put it in perspective. What is a nanometer? Well, it's not a dust mite. It's not one of those. It's a thousand times smaller than one of those gears, and the best way to describe it is take five atoms, lay them down. I got a nanometer. That's awful small. That also tells me that there's exciting things that can happen when I make 10 nanometer by 10 nanometer by 10 nanometer structures. I've only got 1,000 atoms to work with. So if I'm gonna try to make a robot out of that, well, that means I have 1,000 memory elements, and that's it. That's one kilobyte of, or kilobit of memory. So uh, the idea that I'm going to make miniaturized robots doesn't work because I can't, for one thing, have any memory associated with it, unless I make them really big. Then they're not nanomaterials anymore. So instead, I want to focus on the sorts of things that I can do with nanomaterials. Here's a scale. Here's a different way to look at scales. This is something put out by the Department of Energy. It's a wonderful little poster, and it shows you there's the head of a pin that Richard Feynman would like to start writing on top of. There's the MEMS devices. And as I work my, down, my way down on the right side, I'm identifying things that I can make by man. On the left side, I'm identifying things that can make by nature. And you'll see down here in the nanometer scale is Montana State University to tell you that Montana is doing things in the nanoscale. We put uh, materials inside of protein cages, and I'll give you a little bit of a, a flavor for what that's all about. But the idea here is I'm uh, shrinking things down, making small devices, and the good news is we've done it. We have nanomaterials that can do almost anything you want. On the left side, unfortunately, is where all the success has been. Nature has given us the ATP synthase. It's a nanometer machine that's moving energy around for us. Why can nature do it and we can't? Well, nature's had a little bit longer. Evolution has been working for quite a while, and that's where these items come from. If I can find out the mechanism that nature uses in order to make ATP, make some of these proteins in some self-assembled way, but now make them out of something else, that's where nanotechnology has been heading. In the middle, I give you not only the uh, size scale, but I also give you what happens when we use light. So right here's the visible spectrum, and then here's radio waves, microwaves. Let's change this, let's blow this up a little bit. So here's the spectrum again. And you can see one of the interesting things about nanomaterials is they are truly invisible. I cannot see them because they are smaller, 10 to the minus nine is nanometers, than the light I use to look at them. So I would never be able to see anything I made in the nanomaterial regime because it's too small to interact with light. Well, it does tell you what I would use in order to read my things. I told you what I'm gonna write with. I'm gonna use atoms to write my letters. Now I'm going to use x-rays to read my letters. So here's an example. I'm 
I have this nice x-ray beam. It hits, in this case, a crystallized molecule, and I get these little spots. If I use one energy x-ray instead of, if I used a bunch of colors, I would get a rainbow. If I used one color, I would get spots. And that's a diffraction pattern. Here's one of the most famous diffraction patterns that have been made. Uh, if this was a science audience, I'd ask you what that was a diffraction pattern of. And it is. <laughs> and who did it? Thank you. The word is getting out. It wasn't Watson and Crick. It was Rosalind Franklin who actually dis was able to understand the diffraction pattern. And then Watson and Frick said, thank you very much. Go back to the lab. Keep working. And we'll tell you if anything good comes of this. And then you never heard about her again. But Rosalind Franklin was the first person to work out the structure of the double helix for DNA. That is a nanomaterial, right? A nanomaterial DNA. That's how we see it, using x-rays, or if we use the weirdness of quantum mechanics, I can also use an electron beam instead of an x-ray, because electrons also have a wave property as well as a particle property. I can use the wave nature, scatter it off of the gold nanoparticle, la di da and I generate a way to look at things by using electron microscopes. Here is a, oops, excuse me. Here is a picture of uh, a type of electron uh, micrograph called the cryo electromicrograph, and these are of viruses. This is West Nile virus, polio virus, and the way that I do this is these aren't actually what I see, these are reconstructions of those patterns that I've developed. So I use a computer, and I have the computer color code things so that they're easier to determine. If I do that, you start to worry about whether or not I'm actually generating something from whole cloth, or is this really representative of what I should be seeing? Well, I'm gonna show you another way to look at things, and since this is right after lunch, I've got some demos that you can all handle and play with. If you can just take one, you need two pieces. Oops, excuse me. Uh, let me uh, take half of them and get them on the, the other side of the room. Thank you. This is going to be my next view graph. It takes a little while to come out. You need two parts. One is a card, and the other piece is a little stick, card and a stick. This is going to be a scanning microscope, atomic force microscope. Actually, it's a magnetic force microscope. And I've just taken the one that I can buy for about two and a half million, and I've blown it up 25,000 times, so now I'm looking at big scale stuff. The idea behind it, once you get a copy of it, is pretty straightforward. I have my substrate, and I'm going to use the back side, and then I have my tip. And all you need to do is gently holding the tip is to rub it across the back, and you'll feel it jumping around. If I rub it sideways across the back, I don't feel anything. So only when I rub it one direction does it actually give me the bumps. In the same way, that a scanning tunneling microscope, a scanning atomic force microscope, or in this case, a magnetic force microscope, how it works. We are looking at magnetic domains. If I shrink it down, I will look at atoms. And all it is, is the same thing that happens if I'm in a dark room and I can't see anything, I can use the sense of touch to find stuff. So here we're actually looking by touching things as to the magnetic domain structure of one of these business cards. This is like a refrigerator magnet. Now you know what they look like. And the key is, can you figure out what the domain structure is just by kind of scratching this around on the back? Leave it as an exercise to the reader. So what can I do with atomic force microscopes or scanning tunneling microscopes? I can, I can actually write things as well as read things. So here I have three characters. Uh, this was done by Don Eigler, and I guess he worked for a famous company. So the first thing he did was wrote the company logo. I like the one on the left. That's my favorite scanning tunneling microscope picture. Uh, this is iron atoms on copper. Uh, this one down here by Don Eigler is xenon atoms on carbon. I like iron on copper better, and that's the word for atom. Chinese characters use atoms to spell the word atom. It's kind of fun. But this tells me that I can actually write things with this kind of 
one nanometer size resolution, right? If I were to look at that, that's one nanometer, five atoms. So I've got very high density recording. Once again, really slow to read and write. So it's not the direction to go. I hope I gave you a couple of ideas on how I write and how I read and, and how I can actually manufacture these things for um, uh, making ma uh, uh, nanomaterials. I now want to take you to the next step is if I make them, why do I make them? Why care about making magnetic nano uh, or making uh, uh, nanomaterials? I mean, I've got things that work pretty well now. What's so exciting about nanomaterials? And to me, one description of a nanomaterial, and it's a very weak description, but it's used a lot because it's very all-encompassing. And that's anything measured in nanometers is a nanomaterial. That doesn't do much. It's like, as the speaker earlier today said, it's if I made things out of eight foot long objects. Now that's what's exciting. Now, so a better description and one that, me, that describes why we as scientists are interested in it is because it has something called emergent properties. Let me give you an example. If I take water and I form ice, when it's very, very small, the ice crystals are circular, spherical. The bigger it gets, the more structure it gets to it. And in fact, I have very different surfaces as this thing gets larger and larger, going from uh, a few nanometers to 100 nanometers. When that happens, a couple of things go on, exciting things, catalysis, uh, surfaces are very different, interactions are very different. In fact, if I look at the bonding between grains, it gets a little weaker. Well, what's an emergent property? An emergent property is what happens when I put a lot of them together. The grains between the ice crystals get weak and I generate an avalanche. It's not something I would have predicted just by studying ice, but it's something I can understand now that I know it's there. So it's not something, an emergent property doesn't mean something I can't predict, it just means it's something that's a little bit unanticipated. Nowadays, we are anticipating emergent properties, and they are simply to do with if I extrapolate what goes on in the big scale down smaller, does my extrapolation work or does it fall apart? Or if I build up from atoms, do my simple extrapolations work or do I get something new? Let me give you another example, and this is what we look for in the sciences. We look for materials that in the bulk have some kind of frustration built into them. And that frustration is relieved when I get small. So here's an, an example of something exciting in my field. It's just lanthanum atoms and oxygen atoms, a little bit of manganese inside of it. It's become what drives the new computer memories, lanthanum, calcium, manganese oxide, the manganates. But you can see when I make a lot of it, what happens is that I don't quite have enough room for all the atoms. And so they kind of buckle around a little bit in order to make, make it fit. That buckling leads to interesting properties on the macro scale. When I get small, that buckling goes away. Everything can relax back into the space that it wants. When that happens, the properties change dramatically. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for changes in mechanical, optical, electrical, catalytic, magnetic properties just because I've made this thing relax and go back into what is considered a more normal state and an emergent property shows up. And in this case, the length scales are nanometers because I can't have too many atoms, otherwise they're forced into this confined geometry. So one of the things we look for is that kind of emergence. Let me give you an example of one of those. If I take gold particles, what color is gold? That's gold. That's why we call it gold. <laughs> if I make it small, for one thing it becomes invisible, but when I put a lot of them together in a solution, the color depends on the size. So here are gold particles, different size, starting from about five nanometers going up to 50 nanometers, and I can go from red to blue. Right? All I did was change the size. I had thought color was intrinsic to the material, and now I show that it's not. It's an extrinsic property. If I get big enough, that extrinsic behavior goes away and it's all intrinsic again. But that's an exciting crossover going from intrinsic to extrinsic behavior. Here's another example. 
Same thing, colors are always nice in presentations like this. In this case, I, you, you've seen those fluorescent lights, or not fluorescent lights, uh, if, I, if I take a rock and I show, shine black light on it, it glows, that's called phosphorescence. Well, here is something where I shine the same colored light, so I shine this nice deep blue light on it, and depending on the size of the particles, it glows a different color. Now, is that very useful for anything? Well, if I tag things with different colors, shine blue light on it, and it looks yellow, I know what I tagged it with. If it looks blue, I tagged it with something else. So it's a great way of detecting things. And once again, it's an extrinsic behavior that's, that's driving this uh, interaction. And once again, we kind of think of it as a, uh, a, a, an emergent property, not something we expected when we just shrank gold particles or zinc selenide particles down smaller and smaller. So hopefully I gave you a couple of ideas of what emergence is all about, what emergent properties are all about. Uh, what I'd like to do now is touch just briefly on, you, you've, you've seen it before on the, the ethical issues and uh, the societal issues associated with uh, nanotechnology. Uh, they're, they're very important to deal with as a scientist. It used to be that this was one of those fields where you say, oh, that's great, ethicists should take care of this. The, uh, the philosophers and the scientists are in different camps. We will build it and they will understand how to deal with it after we've gotten there. That's no longer the way that uh, things are done. We recognize the importance of identifying societal impact and the implications of generating some of these materials, and so we want to work hand in hand across the disciplines to find out how to deal with it. One way to categorize nanomaterials is to give them color coding in the same way that we do for, uh, I don't know, Homeland Security. So in this case, we just color coded them white, green, and red, and it has more to do with how often you come in contact with things, more so than their toxicity, because all of them have some kind of unknown toxicity. But if I have, the example today was an iPhone, well, if it's inside the iPhone, the nanomaterial, I don't come in contact it, with it that much unless I eat it, unless it breaks apart, but not traditional. Other materials like uh, foods and clothing, things that I come in contact with a lot, those I've arbitrarily, well someone else arbitrarily labeled those green. And then the ones that people really worry about are the medical treatments. When I use nanotechnology to solve cancer, to solve um, cholesterol, all those sorts of issues, that's when uh, it really has some, some impact. The, the strange thing is the white and the red are actually pretty well regulated. And it's this green area where all the problems are showing up. Because we know what to do with medical treatments. We know how to make sure that uh, we're understanding what's going on. We've got, had problems in the past with thalidomide, things like that. So I think that's working its way through the system. Materials are uh, less impactful. Let me give you a couple of examples, one from each one of these, these groupings. Uh, for white, my favorite application of nanotechnology is in the Hummer. We're going to make Hummers with nanotechnology. So this was in the Detroit News. Uh, we're going to, where's the line? We're going to, cars of the future will be assembled atom by atom. I think that will take a long time. <laughs> I think what they're referring to is specific parts have nanocomposites that make them lighter and make them stronger. It's just great materials research. This other bit is just a little too much hype. So. The fact is that in almost every car that you can get, they have nanomaterials because we want to reduce the weight of the car in order to increase the gas mileage. Great trade-off, important to do. What about the green direction? Well, the green direction, I wear it, other people do too. Here we've got some Eddie Bauer clothing, the NanoWear collection. I'm modeling uh, Eddie Bauer pants. This is a great idea. You spill grape juice on your shirt and it doesn't stay. It just works its way off. Uh, and here we have a picture of the nanofibers, really small nanofibers. Those nanofibers are invisible. I can't see them. Then you might ask, well, then why can't I see through your clothes? Because if I have a lot of them together, then I can uh, once again see them. So it's only an individual nanofiber that I can't see. All right. 
Well, we all know what happened when Annie Bauer put out their nanoware collection. It got protested. So here's my favorite protest. We're out here naked so that people can see the problem. So she did get that version of the clothing, which is invisible. <laughs> and uh, the problem is that nanotech is, is radical and unpredictable. And this was the ir or irrational response that we were hearing about today. So these problems don't go away. They're, they're, they're sort of across the board. If I go to the red nanotechnology issues, well, the National Institute of Health, the National Cancer Institute has a center for exactly this issue. How do I treat cancer nanotechnology? Uh, here, uh, I just show you the website, but it's, it's very important for them to look into this to understand how I can use nanotechnology to my advantage, but also what are the unintended consequences of the use of nanotechnology. So I've said a few things. I'm going to now give you a quote that, that I found a little while ago that I liked. It came from EnviroBlog, and uh, I'm just going to read it to you. The United States is the world leader in nanotechnology, but it is not paying enough attention to the environmental health and safety risks posed by nanoscale products. Okay, well, EnviroBlog, of course, they're going to be extremists. They're all the way to one side. Well, this is a quote that they took out of something else. They were quoting the Washington Post. Okay, they're just as bad as EnviroBlog. They're way out there on the left side. No, the Washington Post was quoting something else. They were quoting the National Research Council report in 2006, saying that we are not paying attention to these risks, and we must pay attention to those risks. This is the report, the response. How long do you think it's going to take before some steps are taken in order to make some, uh, uh, put some, uh, um, watchdog groups into place, probably a while. And that's why this is a, a, an important issue to deal with now. That's pretty much uh, the background that I wanted to give you on nanotechnology. I want to now take a little bit of time and tell you about what Montana is doing. Things that we're actually making at Montana State. I know here at the University of Montana, uh, they're doing similar related areas, a little different than what we're involved with. They're doing more catalysis oriented things. We're doing more um, um, a, a different set of projects, but I'm just going to tell you what we're directly involved with. And there's a center, the Center for Bioinspired Nanomaterials that I'm a member of that this work is done in. So I wanted to uh, let you know that all of this work and for the scientists, it's great because it's so multidisciplinary. I'm not talking about crossing between philosophy and physics, which is always fun to do. I'm talking about the physicist talking with the chemist talking with the biologist, because that's the only way we can understand how these materials actually interact. And that's what we have a representative grouping of. So it's fun from the science point of view to, to get involved in these multidisciplinary efforts. The sort of thing we do is we try to make things the same way nature does. On the left is calcium carbonate made by nature, and on the right is calcium carbonate that I can make in my lab. I don't know about you, but I think the left side has a lot more promise to do some interesting things with, especially if I changed calcium carbonate, which is skeletons, bones, into something more useful, like titanium or aluminum, and I can make these structures in the same way that nature has made it with calcium carbonate, I can now make it with aluminate. And that's the idea behind this center. Understand how nature does this so that we can exploit it. One of the things nature does is make a protein called ferritin. Ferritin, everybody needs iron to live, right? You've heard of iron poor blood. If I don't have iron, I get tired. So everyone needs iron to live. Unfortunately, iron is toxic. I have too much iron, it kills me. The body has figured out a way to regulate it by making a protein which looks like a soccer ball. I have some kids' toys, which work pretty well for this demo. Here's this soccer ball. It actually has the same symmetry as ferritin, surprisingly enough. And what I can do is I can open up my ball and I can put things inside of it. And what nature puts inside is iron oxide, and that's how it regulates the amount of iron you have. What chemists have been able to do is take out that iron oxide and put in anything I want inside. 
So what used to be a nanocontainer of iron oxide now becomes a nanocontainer of europium selenide or almost anything. Anything I want to put in there, I can put it in with the right kind of uh, size restriction. What's wonderful about this is that my cup can only hold so much. If I put any more in it, it pours out. So it's a very well regulated canister. But it's more important that I can do other things with my cup than just hold something. I can functionalize the outside. I can put things on the inside. I can change what I have that connects this all together. So I can make a material that has more than one function. It's a container that maybe, I don't know, it uh, connects up to a, uh, oh, let's put a protein, let's make these little green things proteins which stick to breast cancer cells. And the thing we stick inside, let's put in a powerful cancer killer. And then the thing that we put on the edge is something that from the outside I can trigger to break open the bottle. That means I have targeted drug delivery. And that means that I can, and right now we have chemicals that will kill cancer cells 100%, no problem with the effect, efficacy. The difficulty is they kill the patient because the only way we can administer it is by administering it system-wide. If I can target breast cancer cells, I can get around that problem. Each one of these is a hard thing, right? Functionalizing the outside, functionalizing this, putting something on the inside, all of which are difficult but they're fun projects to work on, and that's what we've been doing. We've been working at how do I functionalize the outside with something, how do I put whatever I want on the inside, and then how can I use that. Here's one example of what we've done already, not breast cancer, which is one of the holy grails. This is remediation of chromium-6. Chromium-6 is the Aaron Brockovich story. If I can change chromium-6, to chromium-3, chromium-3 is not the Aaron Brockovich story. It's not toxic. And here's one way to do it that uses these ideas. I put in an Fe2O3, iron oxide. That must be something unique. No, that's rust. I put in a rust particle, a really small rust particle. If it's small enough, it turns into a semiconductor. And when I expose it to HV, which is sunlight, the sunlight gets an electron to go from one place to the other place, the electron then works its way to the outer shell, goes up here, and does this reduction process. So remediation of chromium-6 by making these, uh, the, these small nanoparticles that have rust inside of them. Now there's a lot of rust out there, so uh, the idea that rust is going to give us a lot of difficulties, you might think, ah, no, it couldn't be. But these are nanoparticles of rust, the reason they're exciting is they have different properties than regular rust. Here's a, it, so these are the kinds of examples I try to describe for um, what we're doing with these things. There's a lot more I could go into. What I'd like to do instead is take you to the next level. What would we like to do after we've made a bunch of rust particles that are encapsulated or something else? Well, what we'd like to do is two things. One is understand them, understand how I made these particles and why they behave the way they do. In particular for the, uh, my group's work, we're excited by magnetic materials, magnetic nanoparticles. And the other part is to discover new phenomena that occurs when I put them into assemblies. So we talked about the properties of one of these nanoparticles, but you can imagine in the same way that we described the avalanche or the same reason that uh, gold solutions are different. It's only when I have a lot of them together. So this next part, which is implementing them as self-assembled structures, is to take our building blocks that we've made and build something with them. So that's where things are headed in the future, is how do I build these things? And one of the directions that we've taken it, and the one that's really, I've now, you know, I've taken you from the big view to the view of MSU now, we're into my lab, what we're doing. We work on a field called spintronics, or spin transport electronics. You all know what electronics is. I have a fundamental property of an electron, the charge, and I just move it around. When it's over here, I call it a one. When it's over here, I call it a zero. I uh, write it by moving it around, and I read it by looking to see where I put it. That's how computers work. 
Spintronics uses another fundamental property of the electron, not the charge, but the spin. When it points up, I call that a one. When it points down, I call that a zero. I can do this a lot faster than I can do that. Flipping the spin of an electron, I can do at hundreds of terahertz. Your computers work at gigahertz, right? Imagine a computer that works a thousand times faster. Well, when I think of that, I, well, my computer works a lot faster than I can, so I don't know what I'm going to do with it. But there's plenty of applications. If I, start, if I wanted to uh, uh, store memory, uh, record uh, all the movies that I'm ever going to watch in my lifetime on my laptop, I could do that if I had terabit memory. If I can now take all the movies that I'm ever going to watch and I want to see every time Ingrid Bergman shows up, I could actually have my computer do that for me. So there's a lot of things that terahertz uh, speeds are going to en enable us to do. One of the applications, computers are great, uh, things that you might not think of are sensor applications. So here's a, an example of something called a BARC, a bead array counter sensor. It's already being used uh, in the Department of Defense for looking at broadband sensors of a variety of things that are available in a battlefield, right? I want to see, did, that, did my forward troop unit just get exposed to uh, nerve gas or to TNT, which means some fu someone's been shooting a gun around them or, or whatever? I can have one sensor that does all of it. And the way that I do that is I have a magnetic bead and I have a sensor that will tell me that that magnetic bead is tied down to something here. So I've now got a magnetic bead. I have uh, a protein on the outside which tell, that I'm looking for or something that I'm looking for. And when it binds to these probes and I can sense it, what I get out is a signal that says, you may have been exposed to something. Well, if I have a variety of these different uh, uh, magnetic beads connected to a bunch of different things, I can have a whole sensor platform that tells me exactly what I was exposed to. And it may not do me any good, but it may do the people behind me some good. And it at least will tell people that there's something that we need to be concerned about over there. So this kind of uh, uh, broad range sensor is very important for um, Homeland Security, defense applications. You can also use it for commercial applications. So gosh, I got this thing. I keep going over there to push the button. So here's an example. Uh, I want to now separate out. Um, I, I, I showed you the example of, of connecting down to determine whether or not I have a particular sensor. But now I want to do some separation or assay. I've got a, a, a collection of important proteins or important indicators that maybe I, I, I have some disease. And here's some targets that I'm looking for and I want to separate them out from everything else. I put in my magnetic bead that has these uh, connected uh, features. They connect up and I can now use a magnetic field and separate them. So I can now easily separate what are very important things from things that aren't important. I can also tell you how many of them I have. I can, I can do really quick blood analysis. Um, imagine I'm using this for kidney dialysis to find out what's, uh, or diabetic, uh, for uh, diabetic work to find out what's my sugar readout. And I'm doing it on the fly in my system 24 seven. So I can always know what, what sugar levels that I have. Back there again. The problems are, is how do I attach these bioagents? And if I start making these things so small that they can pick up proteins, this magnetic bead has to be about the same size as a protein. And now we run up into problems that uh, uh, we have to get across. And one of them we've solved by putting them inside of cages. And the second one we're still solving by figuring out how do we increase the magnetic properties of these materials without going too far beyond it. Uh, I have a few more things that I could tell you about. One of the, the problems that we solved that showed an emergent property. Uh, maybe I'll quickly go through that. And then I just want to make sure I reserve some time to talk with you, find out if you have some questions that you would like to ask me or, or issues that you had been thinking of and you'd like to, to have someone's opinion on. One of the questions that we have been dealing with has to do with what happens when I scale things down. Here are the bulk magnetic moment. This is the moment per atom. 
sorry, I gotta show some slides that look scientific, being a physicist. And here's the element, and I'm making alloys, and if I make these alloys in the bulk, here's the value of the magnetism I can get, right? If instead I just took the atoms and I measured their moment, that's these points, and I can't make alloys of the atoms. I got iron, cobalt, nickel, those are the three ferromagnetic elements. I can also make manganese, some other elements, ferromagnetic, but nonetheless, you can see that I've got a big difference between the bulk values and the atomic values, and that has to be the nanoparticle range, right? That's what I would suspect, that if I can make nanoparticles, I should be able to get a moment anywhere from zero to four just by altering its composition and size. Take iron. Iron is a great one. If in the bulk, iron has a value of about 2.2 per atom, but one atom has a value of four. So I should be able to bridge between it when I get into the nanoparticle regime. And let's see how we do that. So we made some, and we measured them. Here's what would happen if I just predicted the moment. All I'm doing is changing its volume, so I have a constant moment per atom, but I have fewer atoms, so the moment goes down, 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 disappears. Well, if I believed what we were talking about before, this is what should happen when I enter the nanometer regime, right? The moment should go up, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that moment going up. So we did it. First thing we did was we grew some particles, and in reality, the moment disappears right away. This is the particle problem I talked about before. It's something called the super paramagnetic transition, it's understood by scientists. We know how to get around it by going down to high fields, low temperatures, higher frequencies, and that gets rid of this after effect. We did that. Uh, I'm not going to go over what super paramagnetism is, but we did that, and it still decreased. Go ahead. It seems like if you have more atoms, the fields would add together and have a stronger So uh, the idea here was that if I just back up a couple, was that if, uh, if I just took the theory picture that we had from the beginning, was that if we were to um, put more and more of these atoms together, the fact that they're in a magnetic field would give me more and more moment. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Right. So our measurements are always made in a big magnetic field. We stick it in our big magnet in the lab, so we get around the problem of uh, something called the demagnetization field that might be present in these, in these samples. So this is the, the maximum moment I could get out of it if I applied a big field to it. Okay, hopefully that answered that part of it. So these are intrinsic moments to the material and what we're, we're hoping to see is that the moment per atom actually goes up instead of being constant. And what we saw was, of course, in reality the opposite happened. Um, Our difficulty, so the, the first puzzle was what we anticipated to happen was exactly the opposite of what actually happened. And unfortunately, what actually happened made these things not very useful because we wanted to make the moments bigger so that we could do something with them. So we have to solve this problem. This is what happens when I take uh, a chunk of material and break it into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces until I get it down to this kind of a size. We do something different. You remember our picture? We have a coating. We coat the outside of our particles. So this was work that we had done on particles that we broke into little pieces. We then measured what happens when we put it inside of a cage. And when we put it inside of a cage, and here are the different sized cages that we used. We used uh, uh, Listeria ferritin, horsebleen ferritin, and something called CCMV, which I'm not going to go into the whole name of what that virus is. They're just different sizes. You know, some of them are five nanometers, the inside region, eight nanometers, 24. Those are the three that we used in this case uh, in order to vary the size of the particles. And when we did that, we found the particle moments went up like they're supposed to. So the solution was that by coating the particles, we made the moment do what it was supposed to do. And then, of course, we, being physicists and all, tried to figure out why did it do this other thing. And there's a strange effect that goes on. When I make a small particle, when the particle is big, all the moments point in one direction. When the particle is small, the surface dominates and everything wants to point out, like a hedgehog or a dandelion. 
Well, when the moments point outwards, I've got just as many pointing up as pointing down, as left, as right, as forward, as back, and they cancel each other out. And so I get a reduced moment or zero moment. And that's what we were running up against. It was a phenomena we didn't anticipate, magnetic surface anisotropy. And by looking at it in detail, we understood where it, come from, where it came from and how to get over it. So that was the little bit of work that uh, we had contributed to understanding this uh, magnetic phenomena. It was an emergent property, one that wasn't as useful. Yeah, go ahead. I didn't get why coating it would avoid the... Sure. So imagine if, if I am one of these uh, magnetic atoms in the middle, I have all these neighbors that are all pointing in the same direction, so I point in that direction. I am a, a uh, societal animal, and I do what the group tells me to do. They all say, point up. The guys on the outside edge, they don't have somebody to tell them what to do. They have a reduced coordination, and so they do what they want to do, which is point away from everybody else. When I put a coating on the outside, I, in a sense, give them a neighbor. I fix this coordination, I increase it, and the chemistry is now generating a bonding that is going to satisfy the surface anisotropy, and now it does what the other people say, which is point upwards instead of pointing outwards. But the coat is not magnetic. You're right, the coat is not magnetic, so the interaction is chemical rather than a magnetic interaction. And what we find is that uh, when we have a particle by itself, it has this outer shell which is pointing always radially outward, whereas uh, for the uh, particle which is coated, we have the moment actually um, uh, uh, giving its maximum value. And we proved this by taking our particles, stripping the cage off, and that was as easy as putting it in bleach, which eats protein, Protein goes away, the moment went down to 20% of what it used to be, we then coated it again with something else, not with the same coating, with a different kind of set of proteins, and the moment came back. And we could do that, you strip off the protein, the moment goes away, put the protein back, goes back up. And so that was pretty good confirmation of this idea behind it. Now what you'd really like to see is, look at every one of those moments and show me a picture where the moments are pointing outwards versus pointing upwards. We don't have an instrument that can do that right now. In about three more years, we will. And then we can look at one of these particles and see whether or not uh, our picture is correct. I'm going to end here, and I'm going to see if there's any questions that people have that they would like to have addressed. We'll start there, and we'll just work up. Two questions. Two questions. Number one. Number one. Uh, with respect to the varying particle size results that you had shown, uh, there was a variance in the that was emitted. Yes. Can you see a similar kind of changes in its physical, chemical, toxicity, or any other kinds of properties, like for the same element? Yes. And uh, if so, uh, like, uh, if, can we define a factor, like one nanometer multiplied by ten, multiplied by ten? You know, can right. we define a factor? And my second question is with respect to social. Uh, we all know that the National Institute of Occupational Health and Safety, they are definitely uh, trying to work out safety regulations for the people who are into the synthesis of these nanomaterials. Right. So view on that with regards to the framework of regulations. Because it's very difficult to form regulations for people who already know. I mean, I just cannot say like authoritatively, but it's very difficult to frame regulations with respect to the synthesis of nanom nanomaterials by comparing it with our current organic or inorganic materials. Right. Uh, the, the things you point out are very accurate. Uh, one of the difficulties is that the behavior of these particles we mentioned are extrinsic. They have to do with their size. We also know they have to do with their shape. Am I now going to have to quantify things not just by their size, but is this a needle or a ball or a rod or a donut? And that makes this a very difficult game because in order for me to actually look at one of these particles and see what their shape is, is a very difficult experiment. And I'm, I doubt you could do that on a uh, uh, sort of a, I need to quantify how much of this shape material you have in your batch that you just made. So those things are going to be very difficult to do. I as a scientist would love to have people telling me what to look out for. Right now I know that because I changed the catalytic behavior 
of something, so this thing now becomes a very strong catalytic material. I can generate hydrogen gas from it, things like that. It unfortunately also means that it probably is a very toxic material because it's f creating free radicals in my system, all that sort of thing. So everything that's good about it has a potential downside. For instance, one of the big draws that people point at is that uh, nanoparticles easily cross the blood-brain barrier. They easily penetrate through cell walls, so I can deliver drugs when I need to. I can also then deliver cancer-causing agents when I don't want to. So the things that we identify as positive aspects, they always have some other aspect that we just have to be careful of. And that's why I think that um, you know, a lot of the uh, discussion about if I'm doing emergent research, how much of it should be dedicated towards looking towards toxicity issues, things like that. You're talking about big ticket items. They're very expensive to do this research. And what's been driving it now is everyone wants all the money to go into the research. Not everybody, but a significant number of uh, researchers who need the money are, are trying to make sure all of it heads in that direction. And they're very hesitant to siphon off, that's the language they use, 10% in order to look at toxicity issue, societal implication issues, all that sort of thing. Many other people are, uh, many scientists are trying the opposite. I recognize the importance of having 10% of every one of my budgets, every one of my grants going towards these issues. So at MSU, our grant for the CBIN, 10% of it goes towards uh, multidisciplinary interactions that cross college lines. Right? That, that makes more important sense than staying within arts and sciences or staying within engineering. I now involve other people who have different viewpoints. And so I think that should if, if we made that more of a required element of every program, I think that it would go a lot further. I know my students are very interested to sit and chat with philosophy students, in, in, unless they start talking about Hegelian dialectics and uh, No, they want to go back to lab. But they love to talk about what's the implications and you know, we're doing something that impacts people. So uh, I think that you could get the grassroots people, the people in the labs excited by it. Question up there? Yeah, this is really just basic sort of technical, but like the gold nanoparticles and quantum dots, are they synthesized or are they generated mechanically by taking a bulk, um, you know, sort of a bulk material right. and breaking it down? And is there a distinction in the field between things made like that versus what, like the bucky balls or swings or whatever yep. they are that are actually synthesized? Yep. Um, it's a very good question. There is a, a, a big breakdown in the field. We call one of them the heat and beat people. They just heat it and beat it and they end up with a bunch of little things and then they try to separate the small from the big. What you end up with is a big distribution of particle sizes and it's not very useful. But it might be commercially available because if I try to make everything by growing them inside of protein cages, it gets really pretty expensive. But every one of mine is exactly the same size so I can study the behavior of particles that only have this distribution. So from the synthesis point of view, in order to understand things, we're driven to the high end, make them terminate the process at exactly this point. As we develop the field, people always talk about faster, better, cheaper. If I can make things more cheaply by heating and beating it rather than by using a molecular beam epitaxy system that uh, takes three graduate students and a technician to run, and instead I just got a guy with a hammer, well, that's, that's great if I can understand how that process works. Okay, more questions? Go ahead. Uh, yes, if I can first workshop, we have a nanotechnology group, and we've been discussing the issue of regulations for the scientists who work with nanoparticles in terms of their safety. So I wonder, in your lab, do you make any special precautions when working with this nanoparticles? Yeah, so the, the biggest danger is contact with the nanoparticles, right? If I can keep them in suspension, if I can keep them in a non-aerosol form, so I can keep them on the lab bench, in the beaker, everything is fine. Uh, the, the sort of things that we work on is we actually want to keep the students, um, well, let's see. For the students, I wish I had my grad students here, they could probably tell you better. For the students, the, the main um, uh, uh, issues that I deal with is telling them that treat this as though it were a very strong acid. If you spill it on your hand, 
it's going to give you the same kind of effects long term as some of these other things. We don't know what they are, so you really want to uh, behave more diligently in the lab when dealing with them. Fortunately, you w work with really small amounts uh, when you're working in basic research. We're not doing manufacturing sizes, so it, um, we do a pretty good job of keeping it all contained. Uh, actually, I think there's, there's more danger in that, you know, these nanoparticles have been around forever. And the question is, uh, our exposure to these things, have be, they been this low level reason for cancer sort of thing? More questions? Yes? Well, I hate to sound paranoid, but isn't the fact that there's a lot of money and anticipation about this culturally, uh, is, is the process, is the science internationally staying pretty open, or are there secretive uh, things within it because of this lore of the big money and... Uh... There is both that are going on right now, uh, so the idea is, uh, I can tell you at many of the conferences that I go to, all of our work is open literature because it's federally funded. And we like it that way because that gives us opportunities to talk with people to make, how do I make things better? Whenever I have these presentations, especially when we're doing the technical presentations, I am certain that in the audience there are the industrial scientists who aren't interested in sharing their ideas. I was just at Seagate Technology. Seagate makes hard drives that go in most of the computers. It, when you ask them questions, their response is always, oh, that's a very good question. They never answer because, <laughs> as they put it, an industrial secret is only a secret if we don't talk about it. So they never talk about their secrets. More fun questions? Anything? Do you think, do you think that the work or the research that you are doing in your lab is different from other research centers? I mean, because uh, it's my understanding that you try to emulate what nature does. So uh, should, uh, should I assume or should I understand that there's no risk or, no, uh, or you see no potential risk on the nanomaterials that you handle in your lab? So for the, um, in our lab, the way we handle them, for one thing, we handle them, as I said before, very, very small quantities. I mean, you're talking about picograms of material because they're so expensive to work with. Um, what I, I don't worry about the exposure of the students to the nanoparticles as much as I actually worry about them opening the hydrogen gas bottle and filling the room with hydrogen gas. You know, that's, that's to me, a more realistic uh, concern about their long-term health. <laughs> um, as far as, uh, you know, it, we don't really do things at this stage since we're just trying to understand how they behave that's really going to expose students much to the nanoparticles. I can't guarantee that they're not exposed because I don't know the volatility of these things in solution. Right? I have a, a beaker that has a small amount of nanoparticles. How many of those nanoparticles make it in, in, into the air just like water evaporates as steam? They're very small mass, maybe they do. People are looking into those things, but I haven't heard from anyone what the, that this is a major concern. If it is, we could do these things in a, con, a contained uh, atmosphere environment, which is pretty normal. Most of the materials we work with are, um, uh, get damaged by exposure to air. We have metals. Metals turn into oxides when I expose it to air, and so everything is done in a contained environment from their point of view. Uh, whether when they get turned into iron oxide, like these guys are, do they still have toxic behavior? I don't know. Go ahead. This is the last question. The question. Last question. The specific definition of a nanoparticle, sometimes it's complicated, but if you would approach this, would you approach the definition, maybe definition on the basis of the size, on the basis of the surface volume ratio, or something else? I would make the definition of what's a uh, nanomaterial is a material that has an emergent property. It happens to be that they cross over in the nanometer region. There are some materials like ice, avalanches occur because the crystal structure is about a centimeter in size. But the physics is the same that goes beyond it. So it's an emergent property. To me, that's what we mean by nanomaterials. Uh, in the field, the reason that it's now referring only to these small things, because these bigger things people could study 50 years ago because they had microscopes that could look at these things. And it's only now because we have the technology, we have the technology, that we can actually look at these things and, and study them truthfully. Before they were there, we just didn't know it because we could never see them. So I think that's really what drives it. Let's thank you guys very much. Thanks.
strange magnets back too, right? Oh, uh, you can keep them if you want. Those were handouts. You never get them all back. <laughs>